the folks on the phone, we don't have slides for this one, so you'll yeah, just you be just listening have to, in. You just have to hear me. So yeah, my name is Sarah. Hi, everybody here and on the phone. Um, I am, as she said, the perinatal educator and lactation coordinator at Bartlett. I'm joined today by Michelle, who is our, um, Michelle Van Kirk, who is our, uh, moving into the role as our new um, director of nursing for uh, the OB department of Bartlett Beginnings, um, <coughs> replacing Karen White. So if if um, you are familiar with Karen and the work that she's helped us do here at Bartlett, um, Michelle will be stepping into her shoes, and we're very excited about that. Um, so just to fill you in on a couple of the pieces that we've brought to you before, um, I believe last year we talked about our baby box program, the, the safe, safe Sleep Baby Box program. We um, That's still going strong. Uh, the Bartlett Foundation has continued to fund us at 100% for that. So that, um, for those of you that aren't familiar, it's a sleep box basically that has a safe mattress inside of it um, that is beautifully painted with Alaska Native art um, on the outside and goes home or is offered to every family um, that delivers with us. And um, by and large, most families accept it and, and take it. Um, it's really just used as an entry point to talk with families about safe sleep. And so um, it's been really successful in that in that regard. So it opens up this whole conversation with families about you know, what are their, what have they been educated about in terms of sleep and, and what are their practice, you know, what are they planning on in the hospital? This is the conversation. And then our um, unit does follow up phone calls with, with families within the first week to month after discharge. And we're going over many things with them, breastfeeding um, success and follow up for their PKU, for their metabolic screening, all of that kind of stuff. But we also do, um, talk about you know, what we asked about what happened with safe sleep education while they were in the hospital and um, are they using their boxes at home, that kind of thing. So it's been a really good conversation starter essentially um, around sleep. And we did do a, a sleep survey that we talked about last year at this meeting where um, we had you know, interviewed families about um, what their practices were at home and um, there were some pieces that came out of that that um, have changed our education a little bit, some gaps that were identified um, in regard to, uh, you know, more things that we could talk about in terms of smoking cessation in the home. And um, one of the one of the big areas was we we find a lot that families um, are receiving the information about safe sleep, are getting this message about don't sleep with your child in your bed, but then because they're so afraid of having the child in the bed, they're taking them out and having them in, falling asleep with them in armchairs or sofas. So that's a big education piece for us now as well. Um, yeah, and then uh, the other piece that we've been really focused on in the last couple of years was getting um, donor breast milk uh, as a supplementation choice um, for all of our uh, newborn nursery babies should, the, should they have a medical need for supplementation. And that program's been really super successful. Um, it's extremely rare for us to have babies that are receiving any formula prior to discharge. Um, most families are electing if they need, you know, it's a small subset that even require medical supplementation, but um, among that population, once they've received information about, um, about their different choices, they typically will elect to um, receive the pasteurized human donor breast milk um, for their supplementation needs. So that's pretty cool. We've been excited about that. And the cost has stayed, um, we were a little bit, you know, unsure as to what that was going to look like, but it stayed reasonable and seems like it's something we're going to continue to offer. Um, and it hasn't increased our supplementation rate. That was something I was, you know, personally worried about that is it going to mean that we're just going to supplement babies at the drop of a hat and that hasn't happened at all. So, so that's been really great. There's new research coming out about that in the world as well as it becomes more, you know, it was previously just NICU. Um, but it, as more hospitals are using it for normal newborn nursery, we're seeing more research there. Um, and then I guess just the other big effort that we've been focused on in the last year has been um, working with uh, Sarah Penniston at the um, at Providence and um, Safe Kids and our local JPD um, to bring a car seat policy into effect here at Bartlett. So um, that's been a big training effort. We went four of our staff received. Um, uh, training and certification as child passenger safety technicians and we've been rolling out a big training to all of our um, OB staff and float staff uh, so that they have knowledge about what is um, legal and safe in regard to our infant patient population and that 
that education is um, now part of our policy and um, that that is, you know, we're checking expiration dates on car seats and recall status and that kind of stuff um, in keeping with AAP recommendations. And, um, and then we also are doing now um, angle tolerance testing or car seat challenge testing on, on babies that, that, you know, meet that risk need. So for us, that's a pretty small population since we don't have NICU babies. Um, it's, I think when we ran the numbers, it was around 7% of our population. So we'll see what that actually shakes out to look like in the end, but we're excited to be um, screening those kids and making sure we're not missing any, any issues there. So great. Yeah. Did you want to say anything about Oh the yeah. We program? talked yesterday about, yeah. So, um, as a perinatal educator, that's a large part of my focus. And one of the programs that I've been really excited about is um, we are we use Enjoy um, material for a lot of our uh, prenatal education, and they have a new online platform that we're using that um, just is going to allow for a lot of customization of information and has a lot of um, ability to communicate from like as the as the educator I can connect with people as they're going through the online material and answer questions for them it also offers a lot of like my goal for it ideally would be to have all of the clinics using it for you know their first time pregnancies especially here's here's this online program that you can use for understanding healthy pregnancy getting that information to them when they're really hungry for it and then we can you know talk to them and connect with them about resources that are available, all of the free classes that we have, um, upcoming events, tours, that kind of stuff, and all of the things that you guys do, so. Great, yeah. thank you. That's it, any, thank you. Any questions for Sarah on the phone or in the room? Nice. Hey. Oh, come on, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> we don't get too many questions here, but, but that's okay. I feel like people have the discussions after, which is great. Um, so I've switched around the agenda a little bit um, just for some time um, limitations for some of our speakers. So next we're going to have Maria Davis, our STAR coordinator here in Juneau, um, talk about the STAR program. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Maria Davies. I'm the STAR coordinator here in Southeast. I did want to mention that STAR, if you're not aware, is a statewide program. And I have listed at the end of this slideshow other STAR coordinators that you could become in contact with if you needed to. So I'm happy to talk a little bit about STAR. STAR, the primary purpose is to help families, people experiencing, individu individuals experiencing disabilities and their families apply for DD eligibility through the SDS. Um, in addition to that, as we're working with families to make that application, we provide short-term case management to families in crisis and also help connect families to additional resources in their community should that be a need for them. So a little bit about DD eligibility. Um, in order to qualify, you have to meet the state standard. Uh, the state defines a, de a developmental disability as a chronic and severe disability that can be mental or physical or a combination that manifests before the person turns 22. So. Um, it's important to also remember that the disability has to result in a substantial functional limitation in three or more areas of their, their life. The areas of life that the state considers are self-care, receptive and expressive language, learning, mobility, self-direction, capacity for independent living, and economic self-sufficiency. Those last two categories only come into play for a person who's 16 years or over. Um, the state considers a substantial functional limitation to be a 25% delay or two standard deviations below the mean. So the individual would have to have a 25% delay in three or more of the above areas. Individuals who are deemed DD eligible, um, after the STAR coordinator works with them to submit that application, when they are, if it, they are determined eligible, 
that opens up access to Medicaid waiver services. People are invited to apply for Medicaid waiver services based on the circumstances of their life. So they, when, when you become DD eligible, you, you are listed on a registry of individuals waiting for services in the state. And for lack of a better way to put it, the amount of crisis in your life puts you higher up on that list. So more stable people who have you know, really secure natural supports are invited to apply after people who maybe don't have that in their life. So it's not a first come first serve situation, it's based on the stability that you're experiencing and your level of independence. If you or when you are invited to apply for Medicaid services, that opens up the doorway to many, a multitude of services and supports provided by provider agencies within different communities. Um, most commonly used support are habilitative services, so skill building um, designed to help an individual increase their independence. Um, there's also respite for family caregivers, access to discretionary grant programs, um, job coaching and supportive employment for older individuals who have developmental delays. Later in life, residential supported living, personal care, intensive active treatment for people who have challenging behaviors associated with their disability, and uh, many more services, especially as a person ages. And I did want to mention that this, um, these services apply to people from birth to end of life. It is, um, like, you can apply for these services when you're 50. However, due to the nature of needing to prove that you had this disability before you were 22, the younger the person applies, the, the more smooth the process goes. So um, typically I present to people who work with children. So um, that is, I try to kind of push that because I definitely know that that you guys are all with kids working with children, but it is a lifelong program. I mentioned that the STAR coordination is a statewide program. There are, oh my gosh, I didn't count, uh, looks like eight or so STAR coordinators throughout the state. Um, we all work together, but um, I, again, I know that many of you are not from Juneau and people on the phone are not from Juneau, so here's a list of other agencies throughout the state that do STAR coordination. Thank you very much. Okay. Was there a flyer that you wanted there to? There are some, I brought some flyers and I brought the list of statewide STAR coordinators so that if anybody's interested or wants more information or would like to make a referral, I will have that up here or I'll give it to tomorrow maybe? Yeah, and this okay. will all get posted on the website, so. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I especially liked the part about the sooner the child gets into services, the smoother it goes. Um, yes. <laughs> that's a great line for us with Help Me Grow. Yay, developmental screening. <laughs> All right. So um, let's see. I changed up my agenda here, so let me take a look. Okay. So next I've got Jennifer Johnson here, who is a nutritional coordinator with WIC. And WIC is doing some really cool stuff on ACEs training, and so Jennifer is here to talk to us about that. I do not have slides okay. because I just got asked last Friday, and I've been in Bethel, <laughs> said said, so I didn't have a chance to do any slides. Very important. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I have a bit of a sinus infection, so I apologize. <laughs> so I just wanted... Um, to introduce myself, I'm Jennifer Johnson. I'm the nutrition coordinator for the State of Alaska WIC program. But a big part of my background has been in traditional foods. You might have seen a little spiral book lying around called Traditional Foods for Alaska Native Cancer Survivors. They've dropped the cancer survivor off, so the new title is Traditional Foods for Alaska Native People. And um, that is a great resource if you see it in your organization because it has little nutrition panels for many, many traditional foods. And we originally got funding for that because um, so many healthcare providers were telling people not to eat these foods. Um, and in my job at WIC, we've recently developed uh, seven handouts on um, 
plants and, uh, well, uh, veggies and fruits out in the Bethel Western region. And um, if you're interested, I can send you the link to uh, how to get to those online. <clears throat> but anyway, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about WIC. I'm sure because of who this group is, you know somewhat about WIC. We give out our WIC. We give out WIC grants here at the state. So we run WIC through 13 grantees around the state. So no matter what village you're in, no matter how small, you can receive WIC through your hub WIC clinic agency. Um, many of our staff moved into Alaska to work at WIC, but a lot of our staff were born and raised in the place where they live. Uh, we serve women, infants, and children up to the age of five, low-income women. Um, and every WIC agency has a dietitian on staff, maybe not full-time, but on staff. But most of our counseling is done by what we call CPAs, or competent professional authorities. And those are people from the community. They might have a high school degree, um, but who go through our online, primarily online training uh, to learn critical thinking and uh, the tools to do nutrition assessment and counseling. Um, some states are moving towards a more trauma-informed care pattern um, to take childhood trauma into account when working with WIC participants. So I'm sure you guys all know a lot about ACEs, which is one reason it's okay to have no slides because you're affiliated with Dr. Hirschfeld, so you know those are adverse childhood experiences um, and how it went through Kaiser Permanente, and he was working with a higher income population than we tend to interact with, so um, our participants are low income, so they're more likely to have more ACEs, and uh, they're women, so they're more likely to have more ACEs. And so um, these are very important to us because they affect health and decision making all through your life. So we wanted to help our staff be more sensitive to participants, help build their resilience, help them be successful parents, help um, them be less judgmental, help the healing process. So. Um, help them recognize that unhealthy behaviors may just be a coping mechanism to try to deal with your, uh, the long-term effects of your childhood trauma. Um, so we were lucky that the Arizona WIC, which has a social worker on staff, uh, because they're at the forefront there of trauma um, care, they developed a very nice online training that takes about 60 to 90 minutes. It's read aloud in English. Um, you go at your own pace. In the middle of it, you develop, you determine your own personal ACEs score, which I think is very nice because I don't like it when it's kind of an us versus them situation. It's very good that we realize this can affect all of us. Um, and the training explains ACEs, I think, in a very accessible way. And I think the link might have gone out to you guys, but tomorrow you were going to see if we could look at it. Yeah, I sent look the at link it. out um, <laughs> at the last partnership meeting, but I'll share it again, including these um, these great resources that yeah. Jennifer brought. I'll send you a link to that. Um, so, um, so this training, I think, gives staff tools for talking with parents to support their success. It helps you, it has little scenarios that you can go through. It's very interactive, so you can determine uh, what would you say in this situation. And Arizona has both WIC staff and home visiting staff, so it's designed for both of them. Um, so we did ask all of our staff statewide, WIC has about um, 60 staff statewide to take this training. Um, we consider it important enough to include in our, we're developing a general orientation for new staff, and we consider this important, so we're going to include it, also baby behavior, of which there is an online course that we could refer you guys to. <laughs> um, but, you know, one thing that happened when we were doing this training is we found that it was um, very triggering for some of our staff. And it does say in the, I was reviewing the training this morning, it does say it can be triggering, it will bring up possibly unpleasant memories for you, and you might want to 
receive some counseling if if it feels if if you feel like you've been triggered and um, one thing that we do at WIC is we do refer so not only do we provide healthy food and nutrition assessment and nutrition education we're a big referral agency so I was just in YK and I or at the Bethel Clinic and I was noticing they have three behavioral health uh, links on every door the phone number to get to behavioral health so it sounds like Bethel has a lot more maybe than some regions but um, so that's something to keep in mind. We're, we're putting the suggestion that definitely everybody get privacy when they do this training. Um, and uh, that's all the notes I have. Does anyone have any questions for me? Is that, um, that's available for anyone to Anybody go could take training. it. That link, it's the Arizona, Arizona WIC developed it, but that link is just a regular online link so you can click on it and go to it. I do have a question. You mentioned can you the... Can just speak louder, oh, Sarah? Uh, just I, it breeze past my ear something about baby... Baby about behavior? Yeah. <laughs> baby behavior was developed by UC Davis because um, so many people have lost the ability to read cues of baby. Yeah. And when they were doing their research, they learned that many, many new parents think a baby should be quiet and asleep almost all the time. And if a baby's not quiet and asleep almost all the time, something is wrong. And so this is a training so that parents can have, uh, so this is a training for staff to help talk to parents so that they can have a better idea of how babies behave and what cues your baby is trying to give you so you can read those cues better. I'd love to see that. Yeah. And that's I a lot. I have a question for you, Jennifer, too. Do you have any of the resources for the native foods, like, um, like for children? Um, like for children? Well, I could send you these out. These are designed just for Western Alaska. They were designed by University of Alaska, Fairbanks Center for Alaska Native Health Research, working with elders and other people in Bethel and that region. But um, I'll send the link to Tamar. We also have some videos. These were the videos were developed by SNAP Ed, which is the education branch of SNAP, which is also in our office. Um, five videos on uh, picking and cooking the plants um, in your house and how to actually use them with WIC foods. <laughs> Can you list the foods that you have nutritional information for? Um, fireweed, salmon berries, blueberries. I'll have to have Iris help me. Sourdough. Uh, definitely sourdough, cran low bush cranberries, I think. Um, yeah, yes, definitely wild rhubarb, and I wish I had pulled all seven because one is escaping me. That's okay. Well, those are really, <laughs> for those on the phone, these are really beautiful. Um, They're very beautiful. Uh, pamphlets on the on the food, so we'll post those. You have them in digital form? Yes, they're in okay. digital form, so you can. Snapped website, right? okay. Yes, they're on the Snapchat.